Well, we made it. Uh, we're at module six. We've made it through uh, to, the, to the final <laughs> module of the course. I uh, hope you're all still with us uh, out there. We're going to finish off the course with a, a look at optimizing and troubleshooting queries. We, we've talked a lot about different techniques for implementing a database throughout the course. And uh, at the end of the day, databases are about accessing data. And for a lot of uh, users using applications, the, the area they're going to get concerned about is the performance when, when they're doing that. And when things go wrong, how do we, how do we make sure we optimize that performance? So, um, Christian, I'm going to ask you to tell us what we're going to cover in terms of uh, optimizing and troubleshooting. Great. Thanks, Graham. Um, so for this module, what I wanted to, uh, to really talk about is a, a few things really around kind of um, optimizing and troubleshooting tips. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, SQL Server weights and the, um, the, the concepts and architecture that supports the idea of a weight. Um, and then we'll talk through a specific scenario that that from uh, within my role, we see a lot of these kinds of problems around joining too many tables. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'll show you why that's a bad idea in terms of how the optimizer works. Um, and then finally, we have a slide at the end where we can have a discussion around some other performance uh, tuning tips that have maybe been sprinkled around uh, um, these six modules that we can consolidate those and, and, and close off the uh, all right. Of course. Good enough. Okay, let's uh, start with weights. Great. So if we think about um, the the way SQL Server works, first of all, and we'll, we'll, we'll walk through this, this diagram. So when you connect to SQL Server, you'll connect in the context of a session. Um, and then, uh, which we would track with a session ID or a SPID in, in old money if you've okay. been around SQL Server for a while. And then when you execute something, so you execute a piece of code, SQL Server will generate a task, which is this kind of internal structure that's used to provide um, a context for the execution of, of what you're trying to use. So we have this task concept. Now, this... Um, uh, a task will then be um, assigned a worker thread. So a worker thread we, had, we don't actually have on this diagram. So we have a session, a task, um, and we'll have a worker thread that is assigned to execute the tasks. So when we talk about things running, um, the only thing that actually runs is a thread, is a worker thread. Um, it's just we kind of abstract it all the way up to an application or a user or whatever. Okay. Um, so we have this session task and worker thread. So the worker thread will be assigned to what we call a scheduler. Okay. And the scheduler's job is to schedule time for workers to execute on a processor. So by that, I mean a logical CPU as we have in this, this diagram. So you may have hyper-thread and you may have virtual CPUs. SQL Server doesn't care about what your kind of process architecture is underneath. When SQL Server starts, it will look at the number of CPUs that it sees when it starts, and it will generate one scheduler per, per CPU. Okay. Okay, so and we call this this scheduler scheduling time for threads on a CPU. We call this a cooperative scheduling model. So this is SQL Server's scheduling model of scheduling threads on on CPUs. So, so I guess when we're talking about multitasking is the term people use when they when they talk about how uh, computers do their work. Of course, what's happening is you've got a query that might take a long time to run, and you've got other things that are running as well, mm. and we're effectively time slicing where we're sharing that CPU across lots of things that are happening. Exactly. And the thread goes on and off and on and off as it. Exactly. Yeah. So this is where fundamentally a CPU can only ever do one thing at any one time. Mm -hmm. And it gives the illusion of multitasking because it's switching between these threads very, very fast. And uh, we call that switching context switches. Okay. So if you ever looked in, um, in Perfmon and you have a look at context switches a second, so this is what it's referring to, flicking between worker threads on a CPU. Right. So if you see a high number of context switches a second, um, it's an indication that there's a large number of workloads uh, trying to compete for time on the CPU. For limited CPU resources. Yeah, okay. exactly. So, um, so we call SQL Server's scheduling mechanism a cooperative scheduler because um, while this thread, the thread that, that's running your piece of code, uh, is running on the CPU, if it doesn't need CPU time anymore in terms of in order for me to continue processing, I need to get some data off disk. Mm -hmm. uh, it will voluntarily yield its time on the processor to let somebody else have a go. So it cooperates with other threads 
in order to provide a more efficient um, execution model. Okay, makes sense. Okay. Um, if we just go back to that slide and we'll talk about the, uh, as opposed to Windows, which has a preemptive scheduling model. So Windows is a general purpose operating system from, um, from my desktop to, to a powerful server. Um, it's written specifically for multiple programming languages, multiple applications, multiple uses, and there's nothing to optimize Windows on my laptop over Windows Server specifically for any particular application. So this is, is what we call a preemptive scheduler. And a preemptive scheduler mod model, you get a time slice in order to do your execution. And whether it's convenient or efficient for you to stop, um, you'll get kicked off to let somebody so, so else Windows have a turfs go. you off to let somebody else use it. Exactly, the exactly. Oh. So, and this is where in the, the SQL Server 6.5 uh, timeframe, the SQL Server team created this cooperative scheduling model in order to control the Windows scheduler in a more uh, uh, cooperative manner. Okay. And this is all leading on to something important, I do promise. It's not just an exercise in how things work. <laughs> okay. So this leads us towards this, this SQL Server weights architecture. So when we talk about threads, so threads can be, for the purposes of this kind of understanding weights, uh, we talk about threads being in one of three states. So the first is a running state. So this example, we have a thread running under the context of session ID uh, 55 on scheduler one. Mm -hmm. So on scheduler one, we're assigned to a processor okay. and we can only have one thing running on a processor at once. Therefore, we can only have one thread on scheduler one in a status of running. And that's the thread that is executing on the processor. Okay. Makes sense? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So if you're not running, then chances are you're suspended. Okay. So, and when you're suspended, so this is an example of where, because we're running in a cooperative scheduler, I still need to run, but I need to get some data first. So rather than me holding up the CPU, I'm going to voluntarily yield. I'm going to switch my state to suspended and I'm going to store information about what uh, I'm waiting for. So anything that's in this suspended state is what we call a SQL Server wait. Right, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and uh, the third state that I wanted to talk about is this runnable state. So we're running in this cycle of I'm running, I voluntarily yield while I wait from, for something, for something mm -hmm. from disk, for example. And then I get that information back and I need to get back onto the CPU. So then I'll join the runnable queue. So I'm, uh, I'm queuing up to get back onto to the running state again. Okay, so I've been on the merry-go-round. I got off to give somebody else a go and now I rejoin the queue to get back on. Exactly, again. exactly. So time spent, anything in the suspended state is what we call a SQL Server wait. Okay. And anything that is runnable is what we call a signal wait. So okay. a signal weight is a way to track uh, CPU pressure effectively because anything that's runnable is effectively just waiting to get onto the CPU. So if we could have a look at signal weights, it would be an indication of, indication of CPU pressure. Okay. But the main area that, that, I, that I wanted to get across with this is this concept of a SQL Server weight. So we have four sessions in there that are running tasks. We've got a couple of weight types in there. Um, which we'll, we'll talk about on the next slide, actually, in terms of useful weight types. Okay. Um, so when we're voluntarily yielding, um, there will be places in the code that will log, effectively, what that thread is waiting for. And if we can track what threads are waiting for and aggregate those, we can essentially have a look at what the bottlenecks are in, in the system. Right, okay. So some of these useful wait types. So page IO latch, for example, is a latch on a page in memory. So if you wanted to um, read data from a table, um, everything that you do within SQL Server has to go into memory. So you do a select star from table name. That data has to go in memory before it gets sent out to you. Mm -hmm. 
So what SQL Server will do is to put a latch on a page in memory in order to, so it's basically saying, I'm going to use this in a minute so nobody else use it while I go and get the data to put into it. Okay. Okay. So this wait is I've taken a page IO latch and I'm waiting for it to be filled. So a page IO latch is a pure wait on reading data from disk to put into memory. So it's an indication of slow IO uh, if you've got a page IO latch wait. Okay. So the second one we have on there is a CX packet. So this is um, a synchronization packet. So this indicates that we have parallelism running on the system. Okay. It doesn't necessarily indicate a problem, but it's the synchronization between parallel threads. So you'll always get CX packet weights where you have parallelism. Um, and by parallelism, we mean there's multiple processors or multiple virtual processors. Yeah, so we've got multiple processors. As we had in the diagram, we had four processors. Yeah. And if SQL Server determines that what you're trying to do is expensive enough, to, um, to overcome the overhead of breaking it into parts and running it across multiple processors, um, it will run that query in parallel, and that's what we mean by, uh, by parallelism. Okay. So a CX packet, rather than indicating a problem, indicates that we have expensive queries. And we're trying to synchronize them across multiple processors. No, it's actually, so if we have four, uh, we're running in parallel across four processors. Yeah. So that's four threads. Right. So we have each one of these threads will have a packet of work to do. So I'll give you each two and a half thousand rows to process. Right. So this guy finishes his first. Um, so then he's waiting on CX packets because he's waiting for the other guys to finish. Okay. So what you end up with is several threads that are finished and you've got one that ends up having to do more work than the others. Um, and that's what, what, what you're waiting for. I see. Okay. Anyway, the short story for CX packet wait is that it indicates parallelism, which indicates expensive queries. And if you're running on an OLTP system, you're not really expecting big expensive queries to be there. So it's an indication that you would go and investigate and find these big expensive queries and see if they're, um, they're expensive because they haven't been written properly or that they need to be expensive in order to achieve the business logic. Okay. Um, so the next one on there is write log. So write log wait is a wait to write to the transaction log. So this is a kind of a high level indicator of <coughs> transaction log write performance. So there's a good indicator there. So LCK, do you remember we saw this earlier on? We looked at locking, yes. We did, we looked at locking. So one of the nice thing about tracking and looking at weight types is that it's not just around resource utilization and resource weights, but uh, it also involves locking as well. So what we saw during the demo earlier was an LCK on a shared lock. So we were waiting, or we were waiting to get an exclusive lock that was being blocked by a shared. Mm -hmm. Um, and we also have these preemptive wait types as well, which were new with uh, 2008 actually. Mm -hmm. And preemptive, you remember where I mentioned preemptive earlier in this so session? So win Windows preemptive. So Windows has a preemptive scheduler. So whenever you see a wait type that is prefixed with preemptive, it means that SQL Server is waiting for Windows to return something. Okay. So a good example of, of where we've had that. Uh, we had a customer that had problems. Nobody could log into SQL Server, and um, or the application couldn't log into mm -hmm. SQL Server. And we found that we could log in using a SQL Server account, but not with domain accounts. Uh, and what we found is when we had a look at the wait types, everybody was waiting on preemptive um, authentication ops wait type. Um, and basically, this was an indication that SQL Server was waiting to enumerate Windows groups from a domain controller, and we found that the domain controller was broken. Right. So by looking at SQL Server, we could tell the customer that they had a problem with their domain controller oh, because we had this new kind of preemptive, um, uh, preemptive wait types. And another one as well for um, Anything that happens in the file system will also have a preemptive wait type as well. So if you're doing, a SQL Server needs to do uh, an auto grow event or you're creating a big file or anything like that, we'll also have a preemptive wait type for file operations. So you can see SQL Server, your query is, is not running. 
um, but you have a look at the wait times and you find it's actually trying to auto grow a file on disk. No, we're waiting for a Windows and that's to finish. What doing so it's really, I, I'm quite passionate about using wait times as a troubleshooting tool because everything from a slow file system to a broken domain controller to a locking problems, you can see within this kind of single, this mm. single view, which is really quite powerful. Okay. So if I want to view these weights, um, mm -hmm. Up till now, we've seen lots of different uh, dynamic management views for a few, few different things, and we actually saw one of these to look at weights in one of the previous demos. So we did, yeah. Let's so, talk so, about those. so, so the first one is is really uh, sysdoc dm exec requests, and um, you can th you can think of this as. Um, like to think of it as a replacement for SP who that we would have used in previous versions, mm -hmm. a store procedure to return who's doing what. So DM exec requests provides weight information at the session level. So remember we talked about sessions and tasks. Mm -hmm. You execute something and it spawns a task uh, to run within this context. Okay. So if you think about an example of, of a parallel query, will spawn multiple tasks. But if you're having a look at DM exec requests, this works at the session level only. So you're not going to see the wait types for any more than one task that's sitting at that level. Okay. Does that make sense? It so, so it does provide a bit of information there, but what we're really interested in is working at this task level. And this is where we would use DMOS waiting tasks mm -hmm. to find out exactly um, who's currently waiting for something. Okay. So I've said that this is uh, it's very accurate in here uh, because it's, it's a live view on who's waiting for what at the time that you, you select from this DMV. And because of the nature of SQL Server and the way things execute, somebody is always waiting for something. Sure. So every time you view this, this query, you get this massive result set that flexes like this. So mm. it's really useful for a live problem. Right. You get a call, everything's running slowly, what's happening? I would go and have a look in this DMV to see somebody's probably waiting for something yep. and, and it would have it on there. Okay. But if you've got lots and lots of users that are waiting for a very short time period, so it's not really noticeable, but over time, um, that would be uh, that would have a cumulative effect on the, the overall performance. Mm -hmm. We would look at this final one here, which is DMOS wait stats. So wait stats stores, instead of a row for anything that's waiting for something, it's a row for every possible wait type and then it has aggregated statistics of how many um, tasks have ever waited for that wait type, what is the longest time that anyone's waited for that wait type, things like that. So it's historical data that the like exactly. you see here. I seem to have an awful lot of preemptive waits, for example. Yeah, Maybe there's something exactly. in the Windows subsystem I need to look at. And this is one of the first things that I would have a look at. If I was having a look at, um, uh, I sat down in front of a SQL Server that's got performance problems, I'm really quite interested in, in what historically, since the last restart, um, have, have things waited for. Um, and uh, quite often you see obvious things will bubble up to the top, like preemptive or disk problems or locking problems. And you can get a good indication of, of why things are running slowly in the environment. Okay, great. So I'm guessing so you're going to show look? us some of that. Yeah, then? let's have a quick look. So what I wanted to do here is uh, we'll switch back to this people database that we used towards the beginning of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll have a look at these DMVs first. So we'll do uh, DM exec requests. So this is one row for any um, executing tasks effectively. So there's lots of background threads. Um, I'm going to modify these to do where session ID is greater than 50. So this is going to show me all of the user generated sessions. Mm -hmm. So just to caveat that, caveat that, Anything greater than 50 will be a user. A user session will always be greater than 50, but there are circumstances in which system generated sessions, uh, there's more than 50, so it will spill over. Okay. Does that make sense? So if yeah. I'm just looking for um, user sessions in general, I, I, I would use this kind of filter. Okay. So I've got two sessions here. I've got session ID 52, which is where I am. Let's just run. That, uh, that select statement. Let me take a copy of that so we can 
use it. If I have a look at DMOS waiting tasks, do you remember I mentioned this kind of transient view? So there are lots of things. So this is what's currently going waiting on. Waiting for yeah. stuff, yeah. But a lot of these things are benign waits. They're system threads waiting for something to happen. So anything that has sleep or poll or wake up, we would tend to ignore. It's in the because, background. It's yeah, like, it's, yeah, it's waiting for something to happen. It's not causing a problem. Okay. But again, I would kind of filter that on session ID equals 50. So I've got 53 is waiting on a trace trace right, um, which is probably the trace that we were running earlier in the day is still oh, running in the background. Yeah. Okay. So if we have a look at finally this DMOS wait stats. So this is one row for every possible wait type in SQL Server. Okay. So we've got um, information around the number of tasks that have ever waited, the total wait time in milliseconds, the maximum wait time for a single thread, and the signal wait time. Remember, we talked about signal so waits. So we need to get back on this evening. Yeah, exactly. So what the the if I could ever, and if I was to give you uh, one single query to run here, it's this sort of view of of wait stats of ordering um, this information by wait time in milliseconds uh, descending. So what this is going to give me is a view of the total wait time in milliseconds that all the tasks running on my SQL Server have been waiting for things. And then I'm going to go down and I'm going to trim out wait types that are benign, basically. So we've got sleep task. So I'm not interested in any of these until I get down to um, CX packets. So we've got, um, we've got exclusive locks there. So this is from earlier in the demos. Mm -hmm. So we had a total of 125 seconds. Um, and that was actually from a single thread waiting for an exclusive, exclusive, lock. exclusive lock. So while on, on a busy server, that may not look like very much, but that was a single user connection waiting for two minutes for an exclusive lock. Mm -hmm. So I kind of flagged that. That's a yellow flag. I'm going to try and mm. find out a bit more information about this. We've got some CX packet rates when we were doing demos earlier on. We had some parallelism. We've got some update locks there. We've got write log. So I mentioned writing to the transaction log has been a bit slow. So you can see just from the demos that we've done throughout the day, because I haven't restarted SQL Server, mm. um, I've got these kind of this background aggregated view of, of wait types that's enabling me to, if I had performance problems or I was unhappy with the performance of this server, I could really dr drill into this and find out what's going on. So it's on. great for giving you that starting point for investigating, here's what we've been waiting on, let's figure out why we've been yeah, waiting on Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Great, all right, well, let's uh, switch back to the slides. So, I mean, I guess all of this really is about diagnosing performance and, and the symptom that you're, you're initially going to get from, from mm. performance is typically that queries seem to be really slow in running. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. So, so here is an example on the screen of um, a, a query that ran slowly. So this is a kind of a real scenario that we had uh, of, of a problem. And you can see that there are a number of joins in there. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that it ran slowly. But what's quite interesting about this is that it's not consistent in the way that it runs. And the reason for that is because of the amount of joins in there and how the optimizer works. Okay. So um, if we have a look at the next slide, we can see that when executing this, uh, this piece of code, so we talked about the optimizer and the SQL Server optimizer will look at a piece of code and the optimizer will work out a good way of executing, of executing that time. But it has this balance of, it doesn't look for the best way to execute, it looks for a good way in a reasonable amount of time. Okay. And what's happening with this query is that we have an early termination in the optimization process, uh, and the reason is timeout. Um, and this is because um, we've hit this threshold of a reasonable amount of time. So what the optimizer's done is there are so many joins that it's done as much as it could to find a reasonable plan, and it's just gonna take the best one in that time period. 
Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so let's have a look uh, at the next slide here, and we'll talk about um, why that happens. So this example here, we're doing um, a join between two tables. So uh, we've got um, customer and orders, basically. Okay. So if we have a look, um, how many different ways can the optimizer choose to join these two tables? So it could choose to join customer to order, or it could choose to join order to customer. Right. So it's quite straightforward, and it'd be very quick to optimize a query that joins two tables. Yep. But the number of choices increases exponentially the more joins you have. So um, the order in which, just on that last bullet there, the order in which joins happen um, is important to the optimizer. In terms of the way that you write your code, it isn't important because that's what the optimizer does. Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, unless you start using hints in your code. Right. So there's a little tip there. If you start using query hints, the optimizer will assume you know what you're doing and it will enforce the join order in the order that you've written. You've it. put in the query. Yeah, so, okay. it, so that's when it becomes important. So if we have a look, instead of two tables, we'll move to three tables. So we're joining three tables. So if we have a look at the possible permutations here now, all of a sudden we've gone from two to six. Right, okay. Um, so, uh, and the the if we expand that even further uh, onto the next slide, so, so the more tables that you join, uh, the more possible term permutations there are. So, uh, so it's an n factorial possible permutations based on the number of tables in the statement. But what's really kind of starts to get quite shocking here is that you've got 10 tables joining together wow. and there's 3.6 yeah. million ways to join those tables together. And um, if you have a look at the next point, with um, 14 tables, 86 billion permutations. So we're suddenly giving the optimizer a really big hill to climb yeah, to figure out what's the exactly, best way to do it. Exactly. And, and, and if we move on to the next point here, so this is even before the optimizers had a chance to evaluate data access methods, which joins to do. This mm. is just the, the join orders um, so it, you're really, like you say, you're giving it a really tough job to mm. do. Um, and effectively, what happens is the, the, the optimizer has to evaluate plans in a reasonable amount of time, as I've already mentioned. Um, but we're timing out, basically. There's no point if the best plan takes 10 days to find and the query takes 10 minutes to run. Right. You're better off having a bad plan that finishes in the 10 taking minutes. Taking the time to find the best mean. one. Yeah, yeah exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. So, the, uh, so what is happening in this situation is that the optimizer is timing out and it's choosing the best plan that it's found in that time period. Okay. Um, but what's interesting around the, the inconsistent performance, it's not that it runs slow, is that it will time out and uh, use the plan that it had found. So it's inconsistent performance in the same plan won't be guaranteed. And this is what was happening in that kind of scenario. Okay, so we figured out the reason that we're getting inconsistent performance is the optimizer is, is scurrying about trying to find a plan and it sort of runs out of time to find the best plan. How, how can we help the optimizer then? So the, the key to it is when you find these tables, you've got 14 joins, is, is really to simplify the query first and foremost. And if you think about it in terms of six joins, um, you have 700 possible permutations, which is quite reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, and seven joins has um, 5,000 permutations. Um, so if you keep your table designed to six or seven joins, that's a reasonable amount of, of permutations that, that SQL Server could run through um, uh, in this kind of reasonable amount of time to come up with a good plan. Uh, and also consider the, uh, the database design as well. Okay. So the solution in this kind of scenario, if we look at the uh, simplifying the query, so what we did is to take this long query uh, and break it down into multiple sections. Um, okay. If we just step through those, those slide builds um, and ultimately we end up with um, a simplified query um, 
which we would then do multiple tables. We'd load them into temporary tables, which of course we talked yeah. about this morning. Um, and then at that final step there, Select from that. We would join those three tables together. So, so interestingly, ultimately, even though we're doing the same query, ultimately, we're getting the same data, it, mm. it's more effective to take the overhead of having to create a temporary table and load some of the data we want into there and then ultimately join against those those multiple temporary exactly. tables than it is to try and get exactly. from the source table. So we're breaking it down to give the optimizer a head start. So we've got what, five joins in the first query there. Mm -hmm. and, and the optimizer can do that relatively quickly and everything else it can do relatively quickly and then you've just got to join them together at the end. So mm -hmm. you're you're not giving it too much work to do in, in one single go. All right, great example. Uh, right. We see that all the time, so it's a real pro tip. Fantastic. Any other pro tips you'd like to share? Yeah, so I just wanted to to wrap up this last session with a few kind of bullet points there that um, that I, we didn't really have time to, to pack in kind of full sessions around True. these, um, but we, we see them uh, in terms of a, a lot of... Uh, performance tuning scenarios and, and mistakes that common people will commonly make. Um, and the first one is around variables and um, and column names. So uh, not having identical data types. We talked about data types earlier on in, in, in the first couple of modules. Um, and if you take um, a data type of int, for example, int, small int, big int. So it stores the same values, but the range is, is slightly different. Um, if you were to take, have a store procedure that took a parameter of, um, um, of age, for example, and you took that parameter and you knew it was going to be small, so you made the parameter a tiny int data okay. type, okay? And based on that data, you took it in and you wrote it, uh, you wrote that data into a table, um, but the age data type was int, for example. Okay. Okay. What happens is there is an implicit conversion from tiny int to int, which is a tiny, tiny CPU cycle change that you don't notice. Mm -hmm. But if you scale that out, again, we're talking massive concurrency, massive scale. What you'll find is that you've got a creeping CPU utilization problem because you've got thousands, 10,000 millions of implicit conversions between data types that look and function the same, but because they're not the same, um, there's a slight overhead there that causes a compound problem. All right, okay. Good so that's tip. a really good one. So the other one here is avoiding the use of, of scale or UDS. So we talked about um, we talked about uh, functions. User defined functions, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, if you use a UDF within a where clause, the optimizer has no idea of the the data that's going to return at that function when it creates the plan. So it doesn't really know how to optimize the plan when you're using the scalar UDF because it can't determine what the what the values are it's filtering on yeah, until it exactly, actually runs the function. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, and, and again, it's a very, very common problem that we see. So show me this data where I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to filter on later. How do you optimize that? Yeah. So, yeah. so what we would recommend is to pass, is to run that scalar UDF and pass that value through as a parameter that the optimizer then has visibility of. Okay. So, so the next one is these massive decision trees in store procedures. If this, do this, and then or we have uh, problems with um, dynamic SQL that's created in a massive store procedure. Mm -hmm. If this, add this and append this and append this and do this, um, because you end up with this scenario that we talked about before with um, uh, parameter sniffing because the set of parameters used to generate the code that you've just created um, won't make for a reusable plan. So uh, again, another common problem that we would see is this, people trying to do too much within a single mm. piece of code. And as you've seen with the joins as well, you're much better off breaking it into smaller units to allow the optimizer to create separate plans for those, those code okay. units. And I, I mean, again, whenever I see a store procedure that's creating dynamic SQL, immediately a flag goes up for me anyway. It's generally yeah, not the way that you want to be absolutely. building your store procedures. 
So that takes us to the end of the end. That's the end of the last module in this course. Um, in, in this module, we've talked about SQL Server weights. We saw some really interesting things. We could see what are the tasks that are uh, waiting on, on you know, system resources or, or locks or whatever it might be. And uh, then we talked about some tips for, for avoiding performance issues. So don't have queries that join too many tables. And we talked about the, the strategy of breaking those up into to smaller queries and then joining them up at the end, exactly. which may seem counterintuitive because you're now running more queries, but each of those queries can be, can be done much more quickly and the optimizer can, can uh, work with those. And then we saw some other performance tips at the end there uh, that are, are hugely useful if you're trying to build a, a database that's, that's going to perform well. So, as I said, that's the end of the course. So we have a, a, a number of things that we've covered in this course. We started with, with tables and views, and we talked about um, designing and implementing those, and, and other table-like structures. We talked about temporary tables and table variables, common table expressions, mm. and partition tables was the other thing we, we, we spoke about there. We then moved on to talk about indexes, and what we were talking about there were our um, clustered indexes and non-clustered indexes that we would create on our, our tables. And we talked about um, how to maintain those indexes and update the statistics and deal with fragmentation issues within those indexes. We looked at stored procedures and functions. So uh, how do we take code that we want to make uh, repeatable to use again and again and, and encapsulate that in a stored procedure or a function and, and use that? Uh, we talked about transactions and uh, coupled with transactions, locking and isolation. So, and, and that's one of the real kind of nitty gritties of how do you design a really good database is to think about your transactions and the locking and, and how you're, you're going to isolate different um, sessions, the, the concurrent sessions you've got from one another. We spoke about uh, in-memory objects and in particular the, the new technologies that appeared in SQL Server 2014. So memory optimized tables and natively compiled store procedures. And we talked in this final module about optimizing and, and troubleshooting queries. So we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, if you are preparing for the exam, the Developing Microsoft SQL Server Databases exam, what we've tried to do is to, to kind of pull out the, the really big areas that you, you should focus on. We haven't given you every piece of information you're ever going to need. So as I said at the beginning, don't assume you can watch this video and then you know go and, go and sit the exam straight away. Uh, use this as a, a, a kind of a way to, to, to look at the highlights of things that you should, you should study for. Now, we are actually going to be um, working together on another course on designing uh, SQL Server databases, which is, it maps to a different exam. Mm. But there is a certain amount of overlap. Um, you know, if you're going to develop things, it helps if you know how to design them. There, there's Absolutely. an implicit you know, thing that makes things more intuitive if you understand the design principles. So I would recommend... Um, even if you're only planning to do the developing exam, it's probably worth looking at the designing uh, a data solution uh, course as well and get a feel for why things are designed the way they are and what are the considerations for uh, designing a, an effective SQL Server solution. So whichever way you, uh, you decide to prepare for it, uh, I wish you luck with the exam. Uh, I hope you, uh, you do well with that. And I wish you uh, all the, the, the best luck and all, all the, the best use in the world of this, this information as you go and continue your career with, with SQL Server and manage databases and develop databases uh, using the product. So thanks very much for your time. Christian, thank you very much for uh, joining me today. Thank you for having me and um, I hope you found it useful and good luck with the exam. Thanks a lot and we'll see you back on MVA for another course some other time.